Welcome to Pseudopod Towers. Get comfy. Find a cushion to hide behind. You're going to need it. Pseudopod, episode 604, 20th July, 2018. This week's story, The Gorgon, by Tanant Lee. Hello everyone, welcome to Pseudopod, the weekly horror podcast. I'm Alistair, your host, and this week's story comes to us from one of the all-time greats. The late Tanith Lee's 1971 debut was the children's book, The Dragon Horde. Her first adult book was The Birthgrave in 1975, and between that point and her death, she was one of the most prolific authors in her multifarious fields. She wrote adult fantasy, children's fantasy, science fiction, horror, gothic horror, gothic romance, historical fiction, short stories, novels. She covered so much ground in such a lot of time, and her work was always lush, incredibly well realized, and beautifully linguistically designed and essential. This story originally appeared in 1982 in the anthology of Quiet Horror Shadows 5, edited by Charles L. Grant. Your readers this week are Scott Campbell and Sharon Moskowitz, so get ready, because the boat's coming in, and the stories you're about to hear, well, they're all true. The Gorgon by Tanith Lee. Read to you by Scott Campbell and Sharon Moskowitz. The small island, which lay off the larger island of Dafu, obviously contained a secret of some sort, and day by day, particularly night by night, it began to exert an influence on me that I must find it out. Dafu itself, or more correctly herself, for she was a female country, voluptuous and cruel by turns in the true antique fashion of the goddess, was hardly enormous. A couple of roads, a tangle of sheep tracks, a precarious escalating village, rocks and hillsides thatched with blistered grass, all of which overhung an extraordinary sea, unlike any sea in which I had encountered elsewhere in Greece. Water which might be mistaken for blueness from a distance, but which from the harbor or the multitude of caves and coves that undermined the island, revealed itself to be a clear and succulent green, like milky limes or the bottle glass of certain spirits. On my first morning, having come on to the natural terrace, the only recommendation of the hovel-like accommodation, to look over the strange green ocean, I saw the smaller island, lying like a little boat of land more just wide of Defu's three hills. The day was clear, the water frilled with white where it hit the fangs in the interstices below the terrace. About the smaller island, barely a ruffle showed. It seemed to glide up from the sea, smooth as mirror. The little island was verdant, also. Unlike Defu's limited stands of stone, pine, cypress, and cedar— the smaller sister was clouded by still, lambent haze of foliage that looked to be woods. Visions of groves, springs, a ruined temple, a statue of Pan playing the Pan pipes forever in some glade, where only yesterday it might seem a thin calm of aromatic smoke had gone up. These images were enough, fancifully, to draw me into inquiries about how the small island might be reached. And when my inquiries first met with a polite bevy of excuses, next with a refusal, last with a blank wall of silence, as if whoever I mentioned the little island to had gone temporarily deaf or mad, I became, of course, insatiable to get to it, to find out what odd superstitious thing kept these people away. Naturally, the Dafui were not friendly to me at any time beyond the false friendship one anticipated extended to a man of another nationality or clime, who can be relied on to pay his bills, perhaps also allow himself to be overcharged, even made a downright monkey in order to preserve goodwill. In the normal run of things, I could have had anything I wanted in exchange for a pack of local lies, a broad local smile, and a broader local price. That it could not get to the little island puzzled me. I tried money, 
and I tried barter. I even, in a reckless moment, probably knowing I would not succeed, offered Pitos, one of the younger fishermen, the gold and onyx ring he coveted. My sister had made it for me, the faithful copy of an intaglio belonging to the house of Borgia, no less. Generally, Pitos could not pass the time of day with me without mentioning the ring, adding something in the nature of, If you ever want a great service, any great service, I will do it for that ring. I half believe he would have stolen or murdered for it, certainly shared the bed with me. But he would not, apparently even for the Borgia ring, take me to the little island. You think too much of foolish things, he said to me. For a big writer, that is not good. I ignored the humorous aspect of big, equally inappropriate of the sense of height, girth, or fame. Pito's English was fine, but when he slipped into mild inaccuracies, it was likely to be a decoy. You're wrong, Pitos. That island has a story in it somewhere. I'll take a bet on it. No fish today, said Pitos. Why do you think that is? I refrained from inventingly telling him that I had seen giant swordfish leaping from the shallows by the smaller island. I found I was prowling Dafu, but only on the one side, the side where I could get a view or views of her sister. I would climb down into the welter of coves and smashed emerald water to look across at her. I would climb up and stand, leaning on the sun-blasted walls of a crumbling church, and look at the small island. At night, crouched over a bottle of wine, a scatter of manuscript, moths falling like rain into the oil lamp, my stare stayed fixed on that small island, which, as the moon came up, would seem to turn silver some older metal, Nemean metal, perhaps, slowed from the moon herself. Curiosity accounts for much of this, and contra suggestiveness, but the influence I presently began to feel, that... I can't account for her exactly. Maybe it was only the writer's desire to fantasize rather than to work, but each time I reached for the manuscript, I would experience a sort of distraction, a sort of calling, uncanny, poignant, like nostalgia, though for a place I had never visited. I am very bad at recollecting my dreams, but one or twice... Just before sunrise, I had a suspicion that I had dreamed of the island, of walking there, hearing its inner waters, with leaves brushing my hands and face. Two weeks went by, and precious little had been done in the line of work, and I had come to Defu with the sole intention of working. The year before, I had accomplished so much in a month of similar islands, or had they been similar, that I had looked for results of some magnitude. In all of fourteen days, I must have squeezed out about two thousand words, and most of those dreary enough that the only covers they would ever get between would be those of the trash can. And yet, it was not that I could not produce work. It was that I knew, with blind and damnable certainty, that the work I needed to be doing sprang from that spoonful of island. The first day of the third week, I had been swimming in the calm stretch of sea west of the harbor, and had emerged to sun myself and to smoke on the parched hot shore. Presently, Pitos appeared, having scented my cigarettes. Surgical and government health warnings had not yet penetrated to spots like Defu, where filtered tobacco continues to symbolize Hollywood or some other amorphous, anachronistic surrealism still hankered after and long vanished from the real world beyond. Once Pitos had acquired his cigarette, he sprawled down on the dry grass, grinned, indicated the Borgia ring, and mentioned a beautiful cousin of his, whether male or female, I cannot be sure. After this had been cleared out of the way, I said to him, You know how the currents run. I was thinking of a slightly more adventurous swim, but I'd like your advice. Pitos glanced at me wearily. I had had the plan as I lazed in the velvet water. Pitos was already starting to guess it. Currents are very dangerous, not to be trusted except by Haba. How about between Defu and the other island? It can't be more than a quarter mile. 
The sea looks smooth enough once you break away from the shoreline here. No, said Pitos. I waited for him to say that there was no fish, or a lot of fish, or that his brother had gotten a broken thumb or something of the sort. But Pitos did not resort to this. Troubled and angry, he stabbed my cigarette half-smoked into the turf. Why do you want to go to this island so much? Why does no one else want me to go there? He looked up then, and into my eyes. His own were very black, sensuous, carnal, earthbound eyes, full of orthodox sins and extremely young in a sense that had nothing to do with physical age, but with race, I suppose, the youngness of ancient things, like Pan himself, quite possibly. Well, I said at last, are you going to tell me or not? Because believe me, I intend to swim out there today or tomorrow. No, he said again. And then, you should not go. On the island there is a... And then he said a word in some tongue, neither Greek nor Turkish, not even the corrupt Spanish that sometimes penetrates from Malta. A what? Pito shrugged helplessly. He gazed out to sea, a safe sea without islands. He seemed to be putting something together in his mind, and I let him do it. Very curious now, pleasantly unnerved by this waft of the occult I had already suspected to be the root cause of this ban. Eventually, he turned back to me, treated me once more to the primordial innocence of his stare, and announced, The cunning one. Ah, I said. Both irked and amused, I found myself smiling. At this, Pitos's face grew savage with pure rage, an expression I had not witnessed before. The facade kept by foreigners had well and truly come down. Pitos, I said, I don't understand. Meda, he said then, the Greek word, old Greek. Wait, I said. I caught at the name, which was wrong, trying to fit it into a memory. Then the list came back to me, actually from graves, the names which meant the cunning. Meda, Medea, Medusa. Oh, I said. I hardly wanted to offend him further by bursting into loud mirth. At the same time, even while I was trying not to laugh, I was aware of the hair standing up on my scalp and neck. You're telling me that there's a gorgon on the island? Pitos grumbled unintelligibly, stabbing the dead cigarette over and over into the ground. I'm sorry, Pitos, but it can't be Medusa. Someone cut her head off quite a few years ago, a guy named Perseus? His face erupted into that awful expression again. Mouth in a rictus, tongue starting to protrude, eyes flaring at me. Quite abruptly, I realized he wasn't raging but imitating the visual panic contortions of a man turning inexorably into stone. Since that is what the Gorgon is credited with, literally petrifying men by the sheer horror of her countenance, it now seemed almost pragmatic of Pitos to be demonstrating. It was, too, a credible facsimile of the sculpted Gorgon's face, sometimes used to seal ovens or jars. I wonder where he had seen one to copy it so well. All right, I said. Okay, Pitos, fine. I fished in my shirt, which was lying on the ground, and took out some money to give him, but he recoiled. I'm sorry, I said. I don't think it merits the ring, unless you care to row me over there after all. The boy rose. He looked at me with utter contempt, and without another word, before striding off up on the shore. The mashed cigarette protruded from the grass, and I lay and watched it, the tiny strands of tobacco slowly crisping in the heat of the sun as I plotted my route from Dafu. Dawn seemed an amenable hour. No one in particular about on that side of the island. The water chill, but flushing quickly with warmth as the sun reached over it. And the tide was in the right place to navigate the rocks. Yes, dawn would be an excellent time to swim out to the Gorgon's Island. The gods were on my side. I concluded as I eased myself into the open sea the following morning. Getting clear of the rocks was no problem, their channels only half-filled by the returning tide. 
while just beyond Dafu's coast, I picked up one of those contrary currents that lace the island's edges and which, tide or no, would funnel me away from shore. The swim was ideal. The sea limpid, and no longer any more than cool. Sunlight filled in the waves and touched Dafu's retreating face with gold. Barely altered in thousands of years, either rock or sea or sun. And yet, one knew that against all the claims of romantic fiction, this place did not look now as it once had. Some element in the air or in time itself changed things. A young man from the Bronze Age, falling asleep at sunset in his own era, waking at sunrise in mine, looking around him, would not have known where he was, I would swear to that. Such thoughts I had leisure for in the facile swim across to the wooded isle moored of Dafu. As I detected, the approach was smooth, virtually inviting. I cruised in as if sliding along butter. A rowboat would have had no more difficulty. The shallows were clear, empty of rocks, and if anything, greener than the water off Dafu. I had not looked much at Medusa's Island. I had begun jokingly to call it this, as I crossed knowing I would have all the space on my arrival. So I found myself wading in on a seamless beach of rare glycerin sand and looking up saw the masts of trees spilling from the sky. The effect was incredibly lush. So much heavy green and seemingly quite impenetrable while the sun struck in glistening shafts lodging like arrows in the foliage which reminded me very intensely of huge clusters of grape on the vine. Anything might lie behind such a barricade. It was already beginning to get hot. Dry, I put on the loose cotton shirt and ate breakfast packed in the same waterproof wrapper, standing on the beach impatient to get on. As I moved forward, a bird shrilled somewhere in its cage of boughs, sounding an alarm of invasion. But surely the birds, too, would be stoned on Medusa's island, if the legends were correct. And when I stumbled across the remarkable stone carving of a man in the forest, I would pause in shocked amazement at its vermicillitude to life. Five minutes into the thickets of the wood, I did indeed stumble upon a carving. But it was of a moss-grown little fawn. My pleasure in the discovery was considerably lessened, however, when investigation told me it was scarcely classical in origin. Circa 1920 would be nearer the mark. A further minute, and I put the fawn from my mind. The riot of waterfalling plants through which I had been picking my way broke open suddenly onto an inner vista much wider than I had anticipated while the focal point of the vista threw me completely. I cannot say what i really been expecting. The gray white stalks of pillars, some temple shrine, the spring, which its votary of greenish rotted bronze, none of these would have surprised me. On the other hand, to find a house before me took me completely by surprise. I stood and looked at it in abject dismay, cursing its wretched normality, until I gradually began to see the house was not normal in the accepted sense. It had been erected probably at the turn of the century, when such things were done. An eccentric two-story building, transiently European, that is, the Europe of the North, with its dark walls and arched roofing, long windows, smothered by the proximity of the wood, received and refracted no light. The one unique and startling feature, startling because of its beauty, was the parade of columns that ran along the terrace, in form and choreography for all the world like the columns of Gnosis, differing only in color. For these stems of the gloomy house were of a luminous sea-green marble, and shone as the windows did not. Before the house was a stretch of rough-cut lawn, tamarisk, in one lost, dying olive tree. As I was staring, an apparition seemed to manifest out of the center of the tree. For a second we peered at each other before he came from the bushes with a clashing of gnarled brown forearms. He might have been an elderly satyr. 
I, patently, was only a swimmer, with my pale foreigner's tan, my bathing trunks, the loose shirt. It occurred to me at last that I was conceivably trespassing. I wish my Greek was better. He planted himself before me and shouted intolerantly that anyone's Greek was good enough to get the drift that I should go. He was ranting, and he began to wave a knife, with which, presumably, he had been pruning or mutilating something. I said that I had been unaware anyone lived on the island. He took no notice. He went on waving the knife, and his attitude provoked me. I told him sternly to put the knife down that I would leave when I was ready, that I had seen no notice to the effect that the island was private property. Generally, I would never take a chance like this with someone so obviously qualified to be a lunatic, but my position was so vulnerable, so ludicrous, so entirely indefensible, that I felt bound to act firmly. Besides which, having reached this magic grotto and find it was not as I had visualized, I was still very reluctant to abscond with only a memory of dark windows and sea-green columns to brood upon. The maniac was by now quite literally foaming, due most likely to a shortage of teeth, but the effect was alarming, not to mention unesthetic. As I was deciding what fresh course to take, and if there might be one, a woman's figure came out onto the terrace. I had the impression of a white frock, before an odd, muffled voice called out in a rapid, too rapid for my translation, stream of peculiarly accented Greek. The old man swung around, gazed at the figure, raised his arms, and bawled another foaming torrent to the effect that I was a bandit, or some other kind of malcontent. While he did so, agitated as I was becoming, I nevertheless took in what I could of the woman standing between the columns. She was mostly in shadow, just the faded white dress with a white scarf at the neck marking her position. And then there was an abrupt flash of warmer pallor that was her hair, a blonde Greek, or maybe just a peroxided Greek. At any rate, no snakes. The drama went on, from his side, from hers. I finally got tired of it, went by him, and walked towards the terrace, pondering rather too late, that I might not be awarded the knife in my back. But almost as soon as I started to move, she leaned forward a little and called another phrase to him, which this time I made out, telling him to let me come on. When I reached the foot of the steps, I halted, really involuntarily, struck by something strange about her. Just as the strangeness of the house had begun to strike me, not its evident strangeness, the ill marriage to location, the green pillars, but a strangeness of atmosphere. Items the unconscious eye notices, where the physical eye is blind and will not explain. And so with her. What was it? Still in shadow, I had the impression she might be in her early thirties. From her figure her movements, but she had turned away as I approached, adjusting some papers on a worker table. Excuse me, I said. I stopped and spoke in English. For some reason, I guessed she would be familiar with the language, perhaps only since it was Kern and Dafu. Excuse me, I had no idea the island was private. No one gave me the slightest hint. You are English, she broke in, in the vernacular, proving the guess to be correct. Near enough. I find it easier to handle than Greek, I confess. Your Greek is very good, she said with the indifferent patronage of one who is multilingual. I stood there under the steps, utterly fascinated. Her voice was the weirdest I'd ever heard, muffled, almost unattractive, and with the most incredible accent, not Greek at all. The nearest approximation I could come up with was... Russian, but I could not be sure. Well, I said. I glanced over my shoulder and registered that the frothy satyr had retired into his shrubbery. The knife glinted as it slashed tamarisk in lieu of me. Well, I suppose I should retreat to Dafu. 
Or am I permitted to stay? Go. Stay, she said. I do not care at all. She turned then, abruptly. My heart slammed into the base of my throat. A childish, silly reaction, yet I was quite unnerved. For now I saw what it was that had seemed vaguely peculiar from a distance. The lady on Medusa's island was masked. She remained totally still and let me have my reaction, neither helping nor hindering me. It was an unusual mask, or usual, I am unfamiliar with the norm of such things. It was made of some matte light substance that toned well the skin of her arms and hands, possibly not so well with that of her neck, where the scarf provided camouflage. Besides which, the chin of the mask, this certainly an extra to any mask I had ever seen, continued under her own. The mask's physiognomy was bland, nondescriptly pretty in a way that was somehow grossly insulting to her. Before confronting the mask, if I had tried to judge the sort of face she would have, I would have suspected a coarse, rather heavy beauty, probably redeemed by one chiseled feature, a small slender nose, perhaps. The mask, however, was vacuous. It did not suit her. It was not true to her. Even after three minutes, I could tell as much, or thought I could, which amounts to the same thing. The blonde hair, seemingly natural as the mask was not, cascaded down, lush as the foliage of the island. A blonde Greek, then, like the golden Greeks of Homer's time, when gods walk the earth in disguise. In the end, without any help or hindrance from her, as I said it, I pulled myself together. As she had mentioned no aspect of her state, neither had I, I simply repeated what I had said before. Am I permitted to stay? The mask went on looking at me. The astonishing voice said, You wish to stay so much. What do you mean to do here? Talk to you, oblique lady, and wonder what lies behind the painted veil. Look at the island, if you let me. I found the statue of a fawn near the beach. Elaboration implied I should lie. Someone told me there was an old shrine here. Ha! Huh. She barked. It was apparently a laugh. No one told you anything about this place. I was at a loss. Did she know what was said? Frankly, then, I romantically hoped there might be. Unromantically, there is not. No shrine, no temple. My father bought the fawn in a shop in Athens, a tourist shop. He had vulgar tastes, but he knew it. And that has a certain charm, does it not? Yes, I suppose it does. Your father... She cut me short again. The woods cover all the island except for an area behind the house. We grow things there, and we keep goats and chickens. We are very domesticated, very sufficient for ourselves. There is a spring of fresh water, but no vaudry, no genius loci. I am so sorry to dash your dreams to pieces. It suggested itself to me, from her tone of amusement, from little inflections that were coming and going in her shoulders now, that she might be enjoying this. Enjoying, if you like, putting me down as an idiot. Presumably visitors were rare. Perhaps it was even fun for her to talk to a man, youngish and unknown, though admittedly never likely to qualify as anyone's centerfold. But you have no objections to my being here, I pursued. And your father? My parents are dead, she informed me. When I employed the plural, I referred to him. She gestured with a broad sweep of her hand to the monster on the lawn. And a woman who attends to the house. My servants. My unpaid servants. I have no money any more. Do you see this dress? It is my mother's dress. How lucky I am the same fitting as my mother, do you not think? Yes. I was put in mind suddenly of myself as an ambassador at the court of some notorious female potentate. Cleopatra, say, or Catherine de' Medici. You are very polite, she said, as if telepathically privy to my fantasies. I have every reason to be. What reason? I'm trespassing. You treat me like a guest. And how? She said, vainglorious all at once. Do you rate my English? 
It's wonderful. I speak eleven languages fluently, she said with off-handed boastfulness. Three more I can read very well. I liked her. This display, touching and magnificent at once, her angular theatrical gesturings, which now came more and more often, her hair, her flat-waisted figure in its 1940s dress, her large, well-made hands, and her challenging me with the mask, saying nothing to explain it, all this hypnotized me. I said something to express admiration, and she barked again, throwing back her blonde head and irresistibly, though only for a moment, conjuring Garbo's Queen Christina. Then she walked down the steps straight to me, demonstrating something else I had deduced, that she was only about an inch shorter than I. I will show you the island. Come. She showed me the island. Unsurprisingly, it was small. To go directly around it would maybe have taken less than thirty minutes. But we lingered, over a particular tree, a view, and once we sat down on the ground near the gushing melt-white spring, the basin under the spring, she informed me, had been added in 1910. A little bronze nymph presided over the spot, dating from the same year, which she could tell in any case in the way her classical costume and her filleted hair had been adapted to the fashions of hobble skirt and Edwardian coiffure. Each age imposed its own overlay on the past. Behind the house was a scatter of the meager white dwellings that made up such places as the village on Dafu, now plainly unoccupied and put to other uses. Sheltered from the sun by a colossal cypress, six goats played about in the grass. Chickens and an assortment of other fowls strutted up and down, while a pig, or pigs, grunted somewhere out of sight. Things grew in strips and patches, and fruit trees and vines ended the miniature plantation before the woods resumed. Self-sufficiency of a tolerable kind, I supposed. But there seemed, from what she said, no contact maintained with any other area, as if the world did not exist. Possibly that a blight or harsh weather intervened what then? And the old satyr, how long would he last to tend the plots? He looked two hundred now, which on the islands probably meant sixty. I did not ask her what contingency plans she had for these emergencies and inevitabilities. What good, after all, are most plans? We could be invaded from Amdramada tomorrow, and want help for us all then. Either it is in your nature to survive, somehow, anyhow, or it is not. She had well and truly hooked me, of course. If I had met her in Athens, some sun-baked afternoon, I would have felt decidedly out of my depth, taken her for cocktails, and foundered before we even reached the dinner hour. But here, in this pulsing green bubble of light and leaves, straight out of one's most irrational visions of the glades of Arcadia, conversation, however erratic, communication, however eccentric, was happening. The most inexplicable thing of all was that the mask had ceased almost immediately to bother me. I cannot, as I look back, properly account for this. For to spend a morning, a noon, an afternoon, allowing yourself to become fundamentally engaged by a woman whose face you have not seen, whose face you were actively being prevented from seeing, seems now incongruous to the point of perversity. But there it is. We discussed Ibsen, Dickens, Euripides, and Young. I remember trawling anecdotes of a grandfather, mentioned my sister's jewelry store in St. Louis, listened to an astonishing description of wild birds flying in across a desert from a sea. I assisted her over rocky turf, flirted with her, felt excited by and familiar with her. All this with her masked face before me, as if the mask, rather than being a part of her, meant no more than the frock she had elected to wear or the narrow-heeled vanilla shoes she had chosen to put on. As if I knew her face totally and had no need to be shown it, the face of her movements and her ridiculous voice. But in fact, I could not even make out her eyes, only the shine in them when they caught the light 
flecks of luminescence, but not color, from the eye holes of her mask, were long-lidded and rather small. I must have noticed, too, that there was no aperture in the lips. This may have informed me that the mask must be removed for purposes of eating or drinking. I really do not know. I can neither excuse nor quite understand myself, seen in the distance there with her on her island. Hartley tells us that the past is another country. Perhaps we also were other people, strangers yesterday. But when I think of this, I remember, too, the sense of drawing I had had, of being magnetized to that shore, those trees, nostalgia for a place I'd never been to. For she, it may be true to say, was a figment of that nostalgia. As if I had known her and come back to her, some enchantment, then. Not Medusa's island, but Cersei's. That afternoon, even though the dapple La Primedie du Fond effect of the leaves was a viridian furnace when we regained the house. I sat in one of the wicker chairs on the terrace and woke with a start of embarrassment to hear her laughing at me. You are tired and hungry. I must go into the house for a while. I will send Clea to you with some wine and food. It made a bleary sense, and when I woke again, it was to find an old fat woman in the ubiquitous Grecian island black, demonstratively clear, setting down a tray of pale red wine, amber cheese, and dark bread. Where is... I realized I did not know the enchantress's name. In any event, the woman only shook her head, saying brusquely in Greek that she spoke no English. And when I attempted to ask her again in Greek... Where my hostess had gone, Clea waddled away, leaving me unanswered. So I ate the food, which was passable, and drank the wine, which was very good, imagining her fawn buying father putting down an enormous patrician cellar, then fell asleep again, sprawled in the chair. When I awoke, the sun was setting, the clearing was swimming in red light and rusty violet shadows. Columns burn as if they were internally on fire, holding the core of the sunset it appeared, some while after the sky had cooled and the stars became visible. A trick of architectural positioning that won my awe and envy. I was making a mental note to ask her who had been responsible for the columns, and jumped when she spoke to me, softly and hoarsely, almost seductively, from just behind my chair, thereby promptly making me forget to ask her any such thing. Come into the house now. We will dine soon. I got up, said something lame about imposing on her, though we were far beyond that stage. Always you apologize. There is no imposition. You will be gone tomorrow. How do you know? I nearly inquired, but prevented myself. But guarantee. Even if the magic food did not change me into a swine... Perhaps my poisoned dead body would be carried from the feast and cast into the sea, gone, well and truly, to Poseidon's fishes. You see, I did not trust her, even though I was somewhat in love with her. The element of her danger, for she was dangerous in some obscure way, may well have contributed to the, her attraction. We went into the house, which in itself alerted me. I had forgotten the great curiosity I had had to look inside it. There was a shadowy, unlit entrance hall, a sort of Roman atrium of a thing. Then we passed, she leading, to a small salon that took my breath away. It was lined all over, floor, ceiling, walls, with the sea-green marble the columns were made of. Whether in good taste or bad, I was not qualified to say, but the effect instantaneous and utter was a being beneath the sea. Smoky oil lamps of very beautiful Art Nouveau design hung from the profundity of the green ceiling, lighting the dreamlike swirls and oceanic variations in the marble that they seemed to breathe, definitely to move, like nothing else but waves. Shoes on that floor would have squeaked or clattered unbearably, but I was barefoot, and so now was she. A mahogany table with a modest placing for eight stood centrally. Only one place was laid. I looked at it, and she said, I do not dine, but that will not prevent you. An order. 
I considered vampires idly, but mainly I was subject to an infantile annoyance. Without quite realizing it, I had looked for the subtraction of the mask when she ate, and now this made me very conscious of the mask for the first time since I had originally seen it. We seated ourselves, she two places away from me, and I began to feel nervous. To eat this meal while she watched me did not appeal, and now the idea of the mask, unconsidered all morning, all afternoon, stole over me like an incoming tide. Inevitably, I had not dressed for dinner, having no means, but she had changed her clothes and was now wearing a high-collared, long, gray gown, her mother's again, no doubt. It had the fragile look of age. It was very feminine and appealing for all that. Above it, the mask now reared, stuck out like the proverbial sore thumb. The mask. What on earth was I going to do, leered at by that myopic, soulless face, which has suddenly assumed such disastrous importance? Clea waddled in with the dishes. I cannot recall the meal, save that it was spicy and mostly vegetarian. The wine came too, and I drank it. And as I drank the wine, I began to consider seriously for the first time, which seems... Very curious indeed to me now. The reason for the mask. What did it hide? A scar? A birthmark? I drank her wine, and I saw myself snatch off the mask, take in the defigurement, unquelled, and behold the painful gratitude in her eyes as she watched me. I would inform her of the genius of surgeons. She would repeat she had no money. I would promise to pay for the operation. Suddenly she startled me by saying, do you believe that we have lived before? I looked at my glass, that font of wisdom and possibility, and said, It seems as sensible a proposition as any of the others I have heard. I fancy she smiled to herself, and do not know why I thought that. I know now I was wrong. Her accent had thickened and distorted further when she said, I rather hope that I have lived before. I could wish to think that I may live again. To compensate for this life? I said brutishly. I had not needed to be so obvious when already I had given the implication on a salver. Yes, to compensate for this. I downed all the wisdom and possibility left in my glass, swallowed an extra couple of times, and said, Are you going to tell me why you wear a mask? As soon as I had said it, I grasped that I was drunk nor was it a pleasant drunkenness. I did not like the demanding tone I had taken with her, but I was angry at having allowed the game to go on for so long. I had no knowledge of the rules, or pretended I had not, and I could not stop myself. When she did not reply, I added on a note of ghastly banter, or shall I guess? She was still, seeming very composed. Had this scene been enacted before? Finally, she said, I would suppose you do guess it is to conceal something that I wear it. Something you imagine worth concealing, which perhaps isn't. That was in the stilted fanfare bravado. I had braced myself, flushed with such stupid confidence. Why not? I said, and I grow cold when I remember how I spoke to her. Take that damn thing off. Take off the mask and drink a glass of wine with me. A pause. Then... No. Her voice was level and calm. There was neither eagerness nor fear in it. Go on, I said, the drunk not getting his way. Aware, oh God, he could get it by the power of his intention alone. Please, you're an astounding woman. You're like this island, a fascinating mystery. But I have seen the island. Let me see you. No. I started to feel, even through the wine, I had made an indecent suggestion to her. And this, along with the awful cliches I was bringing out, increased my anger and my discomfort. For heaven's sake, I said, do you know what they call you on Dafu? Yes. This is absurd. You're frightened. No, I am not afraid. Afraid? Afraid to let me see. But maybe I can help you. No. You cannot help me. How can you be sure? She turned in her chair, and all the way to face me with the mask. 
Behind her, everywhere about her, the green marble dazzled. If you know what I am called on, Defu, are you not uneasy as to what you may see? Jesus! Mythology and superstition and ignorance. I assure you, I won't turn to stone. It is I who have done that. Something about the phrase, and the way in which she said it chilled me. I put down my glass, and in that instant, her hands went to the side of the mask, and her fingers worked at some complicated strap arrangement which her hair had covered. Good, I said. Good. I'm glad. But I faltered over it. The cold night sea seemed to fill my veins where the warm red wine had been. I had been heroic and sure and bold, the stuff of celluloid. But now that I had my way, with hardly any preliminary, what would I see? And then she drew the plastic away, and I saw. I sat there. Then I stood up. The reflex was violent, and the chair scraped over the marble with an unbearable noise. There are occasions, though rare, when the human mind grows blank of all thought. I had no thought as I looked at her. Even now, I can evoke those long, long empty seconds, that lapse of time. I recollect only the briefest confusion, when I believe she still played some kind of hideous game, that what I witnessed was a product of her decision and her will, a gesture. After all, Pitos had done this very thing to illustrate and endorse his argument, produced this very expression, the eyes bursting from the head, the jaw rigidly outthrust, the tendons in her neck straining, the mouth in the grimace of a frozen, agonized scream, the teeth visible, the tongue slightly protruding, the gorgon's face on the jar or the oven, the face so ugly, so demented, so terrible, it could petrify. The awful mouth writhed. You have seen, she said. Somehow the stretched and distorted lips brought out these words. There was even the nuance of humor I had heard before. The smile, although physically a smile would have been out of the question. You have seen. She picked up the mask again, gently, and put it on easing the underpart of the plastic beneath her chin to hide the convulsed tendons in her throat. I stood there, motionless. Childishly, I informed myself that I now comprehend the reason for her peculiar accent, which was caused not by some exotic foreign extraction, but by the atrocious malformation of jaw, tongue, and lips, which somehow must be fought against for every sound she made. I went on standing there, and now the mask was back in place. When I was very young, I suffered without warning from a form of fit or stroke. Various nerve centers were paralyzed. My father took me to the very best of surgeons. You may comfort yourself with that. Unfortunately, any effort to correct the damage entailed a penetration of my brain so uncompromisingly delicate that it was reckoned impossible, for it would surely render me an idiot. Since my senses, faculties, and intelligence were otherwise unaffected, it was decided not to risk this dire surgery, and my doctors resorted instead to alternative therapies, which patently were unsuccessful. As the months passed, my body adjusted to the unnatural physical tensions resulting from the facial paralysis. The pain of the rictus faded, or grew acceptable. I learned both how to eat and how to converse, although the former activity is not attractive and I attend to it in private. The mask was made for me in Athens. I am quite fond of it. The man who designed it had worked a great many years in the theater and could have made me a face of enormous beauty or character, but this seemed pointless, even wasteful. There was a silence, and I realized her explanation was finished. Not once as she stumbled. There was neither hurt nor badness in her inflection. There was something. At the time I missed it, though it came to me after. Then I knew only that she was far beyond my pity or my anguish, far beyond even from my terror. And now, she said, rising gracefully, I will leave you to eat your meal in peace. Good night. I wanted, or rather I felt impelled, to stay her with actions or sentences, but I was incapable of either. 
She walked out of the green marble room and left me there. It is a fact that for a considerable space of time, I did not move. I did not engage the swim back to the food that night. I judged myself too drunk and slept on the beach at the edge of the trees, where at sunrise the tidal water woke me with a strange, low hissing. Green sea, green sunlight through leaves. I swam away and found my course through the warming water and fetched up, exhausted and swearing, bruising myself on Defu's fangs that had not harmed me when I left her. I did not see Pitos anywhere about. That evening I caught the boat which would take me to the mainland. There's a curious thing which can happen with human beings. It is the ability to perform for days or weeks, like balance and cheerful automata, where some substrata, something upon which our codes or our hopes had firmly rested, has given way. Men who have lost their wives or their god are quite capable of behaving in this manner for an indefinite season, after which the collapse is brilliant and total. Something of this sort had happened to me, yet to fathom what I had lost, what she had deprived me of, is hard to say. I found its symptoms, but not the sickness which it was. Medusa, I must call her that, she had no other name I know, struck by the extraordinary arrow of her misfortune, condemned to her relentless, uncanny, horrible isolation, her tragedy most deeply rooted in the fact that she was not a myth, not a fabulous and glamorous monster. For it came to be one night in a bar in Corinth to consider if the first Medusa might have been also such a victim felled by some awesome fit, not petrifying, but petrified, so appalling to the eyes and, more significantly, to the brooding aesthetic spirit that lives in man, that she too was shunned and hated and slain by a murderer who would observe her only in a polished surface. I spent some while in bars that summer, and later, much later, when the cold climate of the year's end closed the prospect of travel and adventure, I became afraid for myself. That dreadful writer's fear, which has to do with the death of the idea, with the inertia of hand and heart and mind. Like one of the broken leaves, the summer's withered plants, I had dried. My block was sheer. I had expected a multitude of pages from the island, but instead I saw those unborn pages die on the horizon where the beach met the sea. And this, merely a record of marble, water, a plastic shell strapped across a woman's face, this is the last thing, it seems, which I shall commit to paper. Why? Perhaps only because she was to me such a lesson in the futility of things, the waiting fist of chance, the random despair we name the world. And yet, now and then, I hear that voice of hers. I hear the way she spoke to me. I know now what I heard in her voice, which was neither pain, nor shame in it, nor pleading, nor whining, nor even a hint of the tragedy, the Greek tragedy of her life. And what I heard was not dignity either, or acceptance, or nobleness. It was contempt. She despised me. She despised all of us, who live without her odds, who struggle with our small struggles, incomparable to hers. Your Greek is very good, she said to me, with the patronage of one who is multilingual. And in that same disdain, she says over and over to me, That you live is very good. Compared to her life, her existence, her multilingual endurance, what are my life or my ambitions worth? Or anything? It did not occur immediately, but still it occurred. In its way, the myth is perfectly accurate. I see it in myself. 
scent it, taste it, like the unscent of an escapable disease. What they say about the Gorgon is true. She has turned me to stone. Horror, like science fiction, is one of those things that changes depending on where you stand, what you point at. From the locals' point of view, the horror is the idiot foreigner who doesn't understand the warnings and doesn't seem especially interested to. From the protagonist's point of view, the horror is twofold. The alien of somewhere undiscovered, and the moment of static when trauma becomes too great, when there is too much information, when your brain simply walks away. I have seen that happen. I have had that happen. I broke my arm ten years ago, and when it was being x-rayed, the tech moved it just a little. I have no memory of the two seconds that followed that. The next memory I have is of the tech smiling in a completely different part of the room, saying that it turns out x-rays were all about negotiations, and obviously my arm didn't want to talk. Trauma. Blank space as survival, pages torn from books, static on video screens, the sound of a tape recorder accelerating inhumanly fast. Our survival instincts are all autonomic and they are all based on the warnings of the environment around us. We are all still and all always will be frightened mammals crouching in the bushes, ears wide for any and all possible threats. But what of Medusa? What horror is there? Well, for Medusa, the horror is that of time passing, of people forgetting, of being sustained by her contempt for everyone around her and nothing else, of the difference between who she appears to be and who she is being a plastic mask thick. Horror as disguise. Horror as honesty. Horror as watching people walk all over your life and your home, unaware of what it means to you. And most of all, for all three of them, this is horror as entitlement. Expecting someone without the cultural tools of a local to understand how to be in a place. Expecting everything to be fine simply because everywhere else you've gone, everything is fine. And Medusa expecting everything to remain the same, even as time does nothing but pass. None of them right, all of them seeing it approach, all of them powerless to stop it. Complex, subtle, nuanced, brilliant work. Thank you all. Here at Escape Artists Towers, we believe in three Ps. Patreon, PayPal and Promotion. Patreon self-explanatory. We have a Patreon account and there is some fantastic stuff on there. From five bucks a month and up you'll get access to exclusive content including constantly updating material. I literally just pushed something new there today. It's myself and Karen Bovenmeyer talking about both Infinity War and Justice League. As well as access to the archive of all the old promotional material. As well as access to our activity feed and at higher levels some other really interesting and good perks. If you want personalised reading recommendations, there is a level at which once a month we make a random draw. We pick one person from there and work with them to provide them a whole bunch of authors they've never tried before or books they've never considered. It's really fun. Patreon is a community building tool in a way that I didn't expect it to be and I'm really enjoying using it. We're getting some really good feedback from the folks who are backing us over there. Then of course there's PayPal. Which isn't as community-driven, but at the same time is still massively useful. Like I say, at Patreon you can pledge at varying levels on PayPal, especially if you go to pseudopod.org and click on Feed the Pod, then what you'll find is the ability to either donate a one-off amount or subscribe for as little as five bucks a month. There, again, you'll get access to the premium content folder, so it's a worthwhile investment, believe me. But here's the thing. We are always painfully aware of the fact that not everybody has the money to assist when we need the financial assistance. We always need social assistance too, though. So if you've heard an episode that you liked, then why not tweet a link to it or write a review of it, especially on iTunes or Google. We could always do with some more of those. 
or write a blog post or if you want to interview one of us or chat to us about the shows then reach out we love doing this kind of thing and it all helps boost our signal and that all helps in the same way the money does so patreon paypal promotion three p's if you can please help out with one of them because it's always needed and believe me it is always appreciated we will be back next week with another of the all-time greats, Thomas Ligotti, and specifically the fantastic story of the town manager, read by none other than Anson freaking Mount. Anson is in the middle of what can only be described as a career tear at the moment. He was incredibly good as Black Bolt in Inhumans, and he will shortly be appearing on the second season of Discovery as one Captain Christopher Pike. I love my job. Did I mention I love my job? I love my job. Next week, just as now, and off into endless oceans of time, Pseudopod will be a production of Escape Artists Incorporated and released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. And we will leave you with this quote from the late, great Tanith Lee. Maidens who stay maidens turn into saints. Old women become sorceresses tough jobs both of these we'll see you next week folks until then have fun it's a pseudopod it's a big foot it's all about podcasts these days